turn this thing on. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, good afternoon, y'all. <laughs> I, I just Googled how I should greet you and y'all came up, so I, I'm, I'm glad I got that right. So yes, I'm uh, Janneke van Geuns. Uh, you can leave the van Geuns, I'm more like Beyonce, just call me Janneke. Uh, and uh, I'm a millennial. Uh, I also work at, at a very cool company, a brand called Google, which is perceived to be a, a great lover. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit more about it today, uh, and especially for the gentleman who just said, like, I, I'm, I'm here to learn about Google. Um, I, I'll tell you a lot in this presentation, but if there's anything left unanswered, uh, we'll have a panel later on, and you can ask me anything. I'll also be at the cocktail hour with a glass of white wine, and again, you can ask me uh, anything. So the, the title of this presentation is pretty big, right? The truth about data and insights. So before I, I get into it, I want to get an understanding of you. If you hear the word data, how many of you kind of like shivel and be like, Ugh. Oh, I see some, some couple of hands up there. It's good that you feel comfortable with it. Because I definitely, the truth about data and insights is that <coughs> data is, is everywhere. It's, it's something that we all work with every day and should not be scary. What maybe should be scarier is like the insights that we derive from data. Like, what are we going to do with the data point? Because I'm wearing white pants today. Maybe there's two or three more today. But that's the data point. Is that something we'll do something about it? Maybe. Because it's not Memorial Day yet, and I already decided to wear this. But is, is that something actionable? I, I don't know. What is actionable is that some of you raised your hand and said, I'm maybe a little bit nervous about data. It's a scary thing. Uh, and I want to make you feel comfortable about that today. So because this is about data, let's just start with a really big number. One billion. So a billion hours ago, if you didn't know, uh, us as humans emerged. And a billion minutes ago, Christianity began. A billion seconds ago, the first IBM PC was released. But a billion Google searches ago was just this morning in the US alone. So every day we see about three and a half billion searches in the US, massive. And about 15 to 20% of those searches are new, new to our database. And it's not necessarily a new word, it could be a new combination of words, it could be a misspelling. And especially now with voice search, it's just fascinating to see how people search differently with their voice than they do when they type. People are very open. Can you tell me when? <laughs> and blah, 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 they go on and on. So that, that percentage uh, that we see as being new every day just keeps growing. So what you can say is that all of these searches are, are moments, right? This is just a, a snapshot of some images of people being in that moment of searching on the go, at home, in the store, like trying to, to find the information that they need at that time. So just a, a snapshot of my moments today. So this morning I woke up and I was wondering what the weather would be so I could wear my white pants. Um, I was wondering if there's a Starbucks near me. Uh, I actually got introduced to Milo coffee, which is a lot better than uh, Starbucks. I <laughs> uh, was looking for the Core Connect agenda, just making sure I'll, I'd be here on time. Also wondering, Uber in Little Rock, is that a thing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to know the directions to this place, uh, things to do in Little Rock, and even uh, the Arkansas accent, just to you know, get familiar with, uh, with that tone. So this is just a snapshot of my moments, but as we know now, three and a half billion searches every day, that means on average 10 searches per person, right, even in this room. And all of those moments we can also label as intentions. Because we go to the search engine with an intent. We have a question, we have something that we want to know about, and we're just collecting all of that data at Google. And this is an actual image of one of our data centers. We don't like to call it a data center. No, we're just calling it an epic library of human intentions, where all of that data is flowing in every day. And so I talked about the three and a half billion searches on Google. On top of that, we have Google Maps data. We have YouTube data, right? What are people viewing? What are they watching? What are they wanting to watch? All of that data is coming in. And it's so fascinating to look at then the range of those searches that are happening. So you probably, like when you think of search, you might think of that very basic search, like where can I buy? And Google already tells you what people are likely to type after that. So this I typed in Chicago, and you'll see results differ by where you are geographically. 
So in Chicago, people are really curious where they can buy Cars Against Humanity. Uh, an iPad, like a tollway uh, machine. Uh, dry ice. Don't know why that is for, but coconut oil. Coconut oil is good for anything. So I, I can like cooking, everything. So these are pretty basic, right? Probably uh, a lot of these searches we do ourselves. But sometimes they go a little deeper. How do I know? These are the ones that are popping up for that. How do I know if he likes me? How do I know if he loves me? But also, how do I know if my iPhone is unlocked? Just <laughs> throw that one in there. And sometimes it goes even deeper than that. Why do I feel so? Why do I feel so tired? Why do I feel so sad? Why do I feel so down? This is a pulse on the nation. This is the pulse of what people are thinking, what they wanted to know about, what their intent is. And they trust Google with that information, which is amazing, but also something we want to cherish. And one thing we would never do is put that user trust at stake. So all of this data is handled very confidentially. So this is a result you see when you type, why do I feel sad? And the first result that comes up apparently is a result that a lot of people spark to and find that that is the answer to their question. So now Google started to do these information boxes because they just want you to not search any further and have the answer right there. And you'll see a little green box around this about this result so that you can also learn like why is this showing you? And this is all based on machine learning. Right? It's not that we are, again, putting the user trust at stake. We are serving the answer that for most people seem to resonate because they clicked on it and they spent time with that content. So what we're seeing now is that searches for why are growing one and a half times as fast as what. So how Google started with more of those basic searches, what can I do today, Where, uh, where's the grocery store? Right now, they're trusting Google with these deeper why questions. These people that are searching, this people data is coming into us, and we're, um, we're being able to give them the answer, else they would not come back. And so it's, it's kind of cool. We did a survey a couple months ago, and we asked people, um, how, how confident or how comfortable are you with sharing your social media data with your family and friends? And most people said, oh, perfectly fine, right? Like, I'm already sharing it with most of my family and friends. Maybe my mom is not on Facebook, but still, like, it's okay for her to see it. But then we asked them, how comfortable are you to share your Google search history with your family and friends? <laughs> And from the laughter, I think you all know, like, yes, no, I'm not, I'm not going to share that type of information. <laughs> There's a lot in there that I was curious about. And uh, <laughs> so we're, we're going we're gonna to trust, if you can trust Google with that data. Uh, the only thing we do is look at this in aggregate and keep understanding, like, how is this human sentiment? How is this search behavior changing? So what we can then do is look at pyramids like this, kind of, Crazy, but if we started with those basic what questions and the how questions, and especially on, on YouTube, we see so many how questions and people wanting to see visually how to put oil in your car or how to repair a certain thing. We're now moving to this why stage and we're just wondering what's gonna be next. I, I don't know the answer yet, but I'm excited to, to see it and track it. And, and that's what my team of analysts is doing at Google as well. We constantly, Constantly keep a track of, uh, of that, that pulse of the nation. What's going on? What are they thinking about? So what I'm most excited about, though, is that all these intentions, all these searches that are coming in, help us unlock insights. So when I started in this industry, it was around 2007, 2008, big data, analytics, just started to take on some, some interest. A lot of people started to get into it. Uh, you saw this buzzwords flying around. But what was missing is really kind of that, that action piece. Like, okay, great, yeah, we need to do something with big data. Yeah, we need an analytics team. Uh, but what's next? So I was very lucky to join a company called Draft FCB. Uh, it's called FCB now, a creative agency. And they were one of the first to have a dedicated analytics department in a creative agency. And my first day when I joined, I found this on my desk. You are a love child. <laughs> And I was looking at him like, gee, where, what, what place did I end up in? This is, uh, this is weird. Um, okay, so Einstein and Picasso. Okay, okay. But then my manager sat me down and he's like, I, I want you to know that you are, you are this love child. Like you come in with great analytics knowledge, right? You have a degree in it, in marketing analytics. Uh, 
But that, that's all just the basics. We now need you to turn that data into art, right? Like into those insights. What, what can we do with it? Just telling me a number, just telling me a fact is, is not going to change anything. So to this day, I keep this creepy picture on my desk <laughs> just to be reminded that I'm a love child. <laughs> so yeah, intentions help unlock insights. So what does Google do with all that data is trying to make it digestible and understandable for different audiences and industries. Uh, so this is an example of the work we do, for example, for the, the skincare, for the, for the beauty industry. So on thinkwithgoogle.com, we publish all this research and white papers, and one of the latest is around skincare. So we did a deep dive on what are all those searches that are happening in the skincare category. Well, if you didn't know it yet, you should get a mask at Sephora because those are the best, and that's what people are all searching for, like which mask is the best. Um, we also then work with companies to help them understand, okay, what, what to do with this data. So a couple of years ago, uh, we worked with L'Oreal, and L'Oreal has a big hair care, hair coloring division. And one of the things that we were talking about is the uh, concept of ombre. For the, for the man in the room, I'll explain this. It's like when you go to the hairdresser, you let the, the, the bottom of your hair like, kind of take on another color than the top of your hair. It's beautiful, and it kind of, kind of, kind of came out of, uh, out of Asia. Um, so L'Oreal wanted to know, like, when is this going to hit the U.S.? And if it hit, it's hitting the U.S., like, how are people searching for that? So we kept a very close uh, loop on, uh, on that trend. And soon we started seeing that people were interested in this trend in the U.S. as well. They were searching for it. Uh, but on top of that, they were searching for at-home solutions. Uh, so ombre at home or ombre self-applicator. And at that time, there was nothing in the market to help satisfy that. This all came from the catwalk and from like these expensive hairdressers, uh, but people were looking for that at-home solution. So L'Oreal, for a CPG company at the time, was really fast and flexible, and in six months, developed a product that satisfied that need. So just based on simple search data, they did some innovation uh, that really helped like, take off their, uh, uh, some of their coloring uh, products. Another thing we did last year was around Google uh, food trends. Uh, so my team mostly works with big food and beverage companies, Coca-Cola, Kraft, uh, Kellogg's, you name it. And they always ask us, what's the next trend, right? What's the next gluten-free? Which flavors should we be looking at? So we decided to do a really big deep dive into food trends, all based on search data. And what we found is there's this major trend around functional foods. So something, you know, we, we're not only looking for nutrition anymore, we want our foods to like make our skin better, make us like go faster when we're running, like we're really expecting a lot of our food. So we're, um, one of the things that really popped was turmeric. So turmeric apparently does all those things you want it to do. It's, it's a magic, uh, magic formula. Um, but we brought that to some clients, and they were saying, like, oh, well, wait a minute, I already have some products with turmeric in it. I just, I just never talk about it. So one of those is, is Kraft mac and cheese. Did you know the coloring is made by turmeric? So it's super simple, basically, to already have an asset that leverages a trend that we're seeing in search to then tout that in digital media. Like the next day, they were able to have a search advertising on that said, hey, turmeric, Kraft Mac and Cheese has turmeric. Very, very simple. And because of that power of digital, you can activate upon that right away. Another thing we're, we're still tracking is, is gluten-free. So uh, for people that know vodka, all vodkas are gluten-free. But the only one that really understood, like, oh, wait a minute, people are so, still so interested in that, uh, is Tito's. And Tito's just started putting on their bottles, gluten-free, and then all their messaging, gluten-free, and suddenly they became this, this bigger vodka uh, brand than any of, for example, Diageo brands. So really simple, like, based on this search data, they can activate, go into digital, and, um, and have people make that connection between the trend and their product. Um, this is a video, it's not working, but sometimes it goes even more tactical where we use search data. So this is Mindy Kaling, who just came out with a video where she says, like, well, um, you know where Coca-Cola tastes the best. Like, she doesn't name any names, but she tells people, go and search where does Coca-Cola taste the best. So this campaign was sponsored by McDonald's. McDonald's knew from search data 
at least we told them, <laughs> that people are really searching for this type of thing, like the, the place where Coke tastes so good. Uh, and without any advertising even behind it, McDonald's is always the first one that pops up. So they decided to just build a whole campaign around it without ever naming their brand, but getting people to go to Google and search for it and find the answer themselves. So a very innovative way of, uh, of using that search data. So you're wondering, what are we tracking today? Well, <laughs> unicorns. <laughs> we talked about it this morning over breakfast as well. Someone said, wow, the pastry is so good. It's like a unicorn pastry. And so it's, it's a buzzword that's already uh, starting to get legs, uh, but really also driven by the unicorn frappuccino, which you probably all saw from Starbucks coming out uh, last week and got a lot of social media buzz. Um, but unicorn food is also taking off. So what do we do now with this type of information? So we turn to those food and beverage companies and tell them, hey, do you already have an asset? Do you already have something that we can put into digital right away and that's going to leverage this trend of what people are searching for? Look at these spikes that are happening. So yes, there are companies that already have colorful food recipes or videos that might feature an, a unicorn. And hey, now they can, can put some bait behind it and uh, really make that link again to something that the consumer cares about today. I also want to point out that this data comes from a tool called Google Trends. And it's a public tool, google.com slash trends. And you can put in any keyword and see how something is trending. So when it comes to your brand, when it comes to your category, when it comes to something super random like unicorns, you can see how that is, um, how that is trending over time. You can filter for countries. You can filter for categories. Uh, but I really encourage you to just check it out and see how your category is trending and even sometimes compare it to something that you might think is big as well. For example, um, chicken and George Clooney, like chicken is winning. Um, or Brad Pitt and uh, pizza. Pizza will always be winning. So it's a, it's a fun tool to play around with and that can give you those quick insights. We also publish uh, top charts on that so you can see on a monthly basis within certain categories what are those top words that people are searching for. So with all of this, like when we go to these clients and we turn around and say, hey, this is cool data, or they found it themselves through a, a tool like Google uh, Trends, often what we notice, and especially with these bigger CPG companies, is like, oh, yeah, but we don't have the exact right content. We don't know. Oh, yeah, this doesn't feel good enough to put out there. And that's when we tell them about this principle, which we also hold true in our, in our way of working. And that's sometimes 80% is good enough. Let's put it out there. right? Test and see what it does. Again, because of digital today, we don't have to have it all perfect. We're not committing to a three-month campaign on TV and millions of dollars. No, we're just going to put a couple hundred dollars behind this content and see if people are working with it, if they're responding to it. If not, let's pull it, maybe optimize it, maybe pull it all together. But let's be more comfortable in putting those things out there. And as an analytics person, I mean, this is one of the, the quotes I, I learned in school as well from Lord Kelvin. Um, you need to be able to always express things in numbers. Like we need to be able to measure it and we need to be able to say what it does for our business. But in this today's world, it's not always that easy. For example, if we take United and Pepsi. If we would just look at the numbers right now, it would be like, wow, look at that, United and Pepsi getting all this interest, cool, like we're, do we're doing something right. <laughs> So we, we all know that something went really wrong, wrong and that sparked this interest. And that's when we have to take a step back and really think again about that brand essence. And are we nimble and humble when we look at this type of data? Are we giving the consumers the right answers, the right approach to um, how our, our business should be, um, placing, be placed in their lives? So this is something how at Google we look at problems. We always put the users first, right? If users can't spell, it's our problem. If you make a, a, a misspelling, we'll give you a suggestion on what, did you mean this? Yeah, and we're just accommodating that. If you don't know how to form that query, it's our problem. If they don't know what words to use, it's our problem. They can't speak the language, it's our problem. If there's not enough content in the web, it's our problem. If the web's too slow, it's our problem. And that's something that the United CEO didn't do at all, right? He blamed. Or he even said, like, no, we all handled the right way. It was just that person was the consumer, our user, um, was, uh, was the one who caused all of this. If you just said, like, no, it was our mistake, we're going to fix it, it would have been a whole different story. So looking at the whole problem. 
And that's what we did with Google Glass as well. I'm not going to tell you a rose story about Google Glass. <laughs> In 2013, that's the first time we launched it, and there was a big hype around it, and this was going to be the next big thing. Uh, we shipped about 2,000, and uh, we saw not every user being happy with it. Also, the way it was perceived in community, like people found it creepy. Uh, so we had to go back and, and really understand the use cases. Like, is Google Glass, is this the right product for the market right now? And what we found is that the use cases that were most powerful were the ones in B2B or like in healthcare even, like when you uh, do an operation, uh, do a surgery, uh, that's where this, this thing came in handy. But not for our consumers day to day. We would all find it creepy if people would sit here with Google Glass. So there we were nimble. We were looking at that, that user response, not only at the numbers, and we're able to iterate. And after 80%, we're able to put it back into market at 100% for the right audience. So some things to walk away with today. So when we tell our stories to our clients or to our consumers, we always like to do it in this framework, care, do, impact. We have to first tell the consumer, the client, why should they even care? And that's where the data comes in. Then tell them what to do. Be prescriptive. Like we can say, hey, I think this is a great uh, video activation, or let's just try this with a search ad, or hey, this is a, a digital display opportunity. And then measure that impact. But measure it with that humbleness, with that nimbleness, and understand really the human nature behind it. Don't just look at the numbers and accept them as they are. So with that, I hope you took away a couple Google things, uh, but definitely open for more questions later. Um, and with that, thank you.